think we're going. Here we are. We're live, guys. Don't you guys love that little intro? People say, Ted, I could hear you talking. Yep, you could. It's Ted Bogert. We're back with the Ted Show. Super excited to have this amazing human being on the show, Eric Wilson, with Hearts, Hands, and Hope. We're going to talk about that organization being the change you seek in the world, how to do that, and all sorts of things that are going on in the nonprofit world, but also, most importantly, in our backyard, in our communities. And um, Eric's got his finger on the pulse of that. So welcome back, Eric. How you doing, buddy? It's been a year. Happy anniversary. Happy <laughs> anniversary. Who could believe it? And so much has changed in a year, wow. hasn't it? Let's put a little frame in mind. Um, I was on your show about a year and four months ago. And that's important because a year ago, everybody was freaking out. But a year and four months ago, it was December. We were happy. We were, you know, celebratory. We had, you know, hope of a uh, new future. None of this, you know, COVID-19 was over there. Right. <laughs> and then three months later, the world stopped. It stopped. It the did. president told us to stay home, right? Stay home. <laughs> never in my lifetime had that happened. Never, never. And so um, can't explain the toilet paper thing. Don't, uh, don't understand it. I can Still explain. to this day, don't understand. What's up, Greg Flower? I don't get that one, one iota. Why, why could I find all the liquor I wanted, yet <laughs> couldn't do anything? All right, you're talking to the wrong person on that. I got priorities. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. You could find all these, to me, non-essential yeah. things, and yeah. then you couldn't. People were going nuts. I, I just, I don't, I don't. I remember being panicked because of that overall. Not even COVID at the time. It was the no toilet it, paper. It was okay. So let's let's start from there. So there was that feeling of what can we do, and the world stepped up. They really did. The entire communities everywhere, they started introducing themselves to their neighbors. In my community, I, I had neighbors just a couple blocks down that just moved in. I didn't know. Right. And now we're helping them and we're helping them. And Michelle and I, who founded Hearts, Hands and Hope, said, you know, we should do something more. We should have a measurable metric. And I call that impact. And I said, how can we increase our impact? Our impact, therefore, was going to be something. And we decided our impact is going to be very specific. It's going to be we feed hungry children, right? Perfect. Because the children didn't choose to be children. They didn't choose their situation, whether it's born in luxury, middle class, or poverty. Children did not choose that. Adults, however, have made their choices and corrected them, not corrected them. I wasn't going to focus on that. That's not a, that wasn't going to be the impact that Hearts, Hands and Hope was going to make. We were going to make an impact on the bellies of children because when a child is hungry, they compromise themselves. And I'm talking anywhere from 21 to zero. Then we had to kind of like make it more school age and get more focused. But once we became focused in March, you know, a year ago, uh, there was, you know, the toilet paper pandemic, there was that pandemic and this pandemic, but the underlying pandemic as a visionary, you know, the meteorologist inside of me, it was like, okay, this is happening now. What's going to happen two years from now? What's going to happen to the market? when nobody's working, what's gonna happen? Where's the commerce? How is this gonna change how we live our lives? How, I, I mean, we order food from Publix? <laughs> so much has changed, right? I mean, I, I used to you, think that was what crazy. I remember the most from our conversations around that beginning time was that <clears throat> with your specific mission in place, then you had schools shut down. And so a lot of those kids got fed at school. That was gone, or at least wow. temporarily, long enough for it to be a very big, giant concern. And so you had a whole new world to try to maneuver through to get to more people, because now the demand was even higher than it was prior, I imagine. Ten times higher. Crazy. Ten times. So we decided to do a car line. 
And we partnered with Second Harvest Food Bank, who got grants from the administration at the time, emergency grants, and that allowed Second Harvest to purchase more from the growers. But Second Harvest, who I love, Greg Higgerson, and I love Lynette Jarvis, and I love everybody there. I great just people. wouldn't do anything without them. However, they love us right back because there are 550 people like us that we're called independent food distributors. We distribute the food from Second Harvest to the need, right? Without these 550 independent food distributors, the food stays in Second Harvest. And that's not just Second Harvest. All over Florida, there's Feeding America, yeah. on the East Coast, everybody's got their niche, but Second Harvest is Central Florida. And so we became Seminole County, and we went into the what's called the desert areas of Seminole County, where kids were bused, they biked, or they walked to school to get their food because they hadn't eaten since Friday. That was the old pandemic. That was the, that was the old impact that we were making. Weekends, long holiday breaks, and summer. Now, we've got nobody working. Everyone's at home. Nobody knows, you know, nobody's getting paid. Everybody's on furlough. Do I have a job? Do I not have a job? Meanwhile, time is ticking. A day goes by. Two days go by. We have to feed these people. So it became, okay, we're going to feed the children, but if their parents are hungry too, they should get a box of food as well. So you just expanded your entire universe. Well, you have, I mean, isn't that what being philanthropic is all about? You, if you have to shift because the need is so overwhelming, but yeah. that doesn't mean it wasn't hard for you. I want to go back really quick before you're going to de detail. I think yeah. it's so important to point out that there are 550 food dis distribution channels, 550 just here, right? Just right in Orange County insane yeah. amount of of demand for that that's huge okay so we went from being nobody right out of 550 we weren't even a blip on the map when you and i were celebrating last week last time we were in a really jovial mood having a good time talking about what i used to be as a meteorologist and now i'm trying this thing and you know <laughs> i think i'll never remember the quote i'll always remember the quote where you said, uh, and everyone said, that's a great idea, Eric. And they came on board and, <laughs> and I went, uh, no. <laughs> that's not the story. <laughs> that's not the story. So um, out of the 550, when it comes to Seminole County, we're the number one distributor, Wow. independent food distributor. We distribute 7,000 meals a week. 7,000 <laughs> meals a week. Here's some numbers for you. An average meal costs $3.48, according to feedingamerica.com, right? And if you're hungry, you probably have less than $5 in your pocket for your family, right? Because you're not working, you're hungry, you've got two or three kids. What are you going to do when a meal, when one meal costs three fifty eight? When was the last time you went anywhere and paid $3.48 and tipped the waiter, right? You didn't, right? So our, I felt we had a good, stable platform where you could sponsor a child for $25 a week, just one child, and give them seven breakfasts, seven lunches, all prepared by chefs, and all delivered to a, a single location. Well, when the word got out, the car line was back around. We needed sheriffs to divert. You know, you remember the car lines in the early 80s? I do very, very well. Very well. Yeah. And it just seemed like we were on to something. And so we spread to Goldsboro. We spread to uh, parts of Lake Mary. We spread to Altamont Springs. We spread to Oviedo. We spread, I, it was like, it, we were on fire. Uh, How was that like from a, from a uh, manning it? Uh, do we say manning anymore? From staffing it. Um, what was that neat. like? We having a hard time? It was neat. <laughs> It was no. all you, brother, all you. No, because uh, all the, the entire board's going to watch this show, and I'm going to get a lot of flack for that. <laughs> um, 
He meant well, we, guys. He meant well. We could not survive without our volunteers. The Midway Coalition, for example, every week for the last 54 weeks in a row through Thanksgiving, through Christmas, through all the holidays, once things started to get semi back to normal and we're all wearing masks, they show up every week to pass out over 7,000 meals That's every beautiful. Thursday to just yeah. one location. And we run out. We run out. And uh, it's hard. Let's talk about that because 7,000 meals, guys. I really just want to – when you say numbers, those are the kind of things when I hear stuff like that, I'm just in awe. And then I'm also like, how in God's name did you all pull that off or do it? So tell okay. us what that looks like from, because it's not just, you guys have to work with chefs. You have to make sure it's boxed properly, bagged properly, compliant, COVID compliant. Everybody say, like, it's not just a, here's your box for breakfast this morning. There's a whole right. bunch of stuff that goes into it just to get the food to them, right? So it starts with the growers and the grant that Second Harvest used, uh, paid for the chefs and all the volunteers to package all the food early in the morning, like from two to four in the morning. Then the drivers who are all on rent, uh, you know, the transportation, they cost money, sure. uh, show up at six or seven and they load up the trucks, 150 boxes per pallet. So we would get, you know, six or seven pallets, at uh, our Midway location, for example, and I'm just using that one as an example. And so here comes prepackaged food that has to be temperature controlled, which was really hard during the summer sure. and, the, and the thunderstorms because we didn't have, you know, any way to, we bought a whole bunch of tents later. Oh, and yeah. I mean, it was just, we're standing there in the pouring rain and handing these people that are starving. And it, um, just to answer your question, it goes from the growers the growers get paid by the government through the grants from Second Harvest. Second Harvest then, in-kind donation, gives us thousands of dollars worth of food each week. So uh, if a meal costs three forty-eight, we get it for, if we had to um, pay entirely for it, it would be $1.72 per meal times 7000 per week. So... Here's some more numbers for you. We have distributed since this week, last year, 329,993 meals. The year prior to that, we distributed 4,900 meals. And that Holy was moly. Yeah. So how does that work from a how does that work from an Eric perspective? Because you know I'm gonna ask that question. I have to. I really want people to see the human side of this. And they're seeing it on the delivery of it, and they know that you are doing amazing work. But there's also humans behind this that are constantly in the throes of it, like Eric and his team are, Eric and his wife are. Um, and so where does that energy come from? Did you have moments during that where you're like, I don't know how we're gonna do it? And how has that changed since for 2021? That's really that's really a great question. Last year, we were just playing catch up. We were like, there's more need. Okay. We called Second Harvest. They had the grant. We went to there. We'd call some volunteers. We'd get it organized. We'd rush get the tent. It just seemed we weren't spending enough time on infrastructure, committees, volunteer coordinators, stuff like that. It was just like, it was reactionary uh, towards Q3. Towards Q4, it became clear to me, I can't keep doing this, okay? <laughs> Finally, it dawned on you, right? <laughs> well, it's just my heart was in it. I mean, when you, when you hand the food to the kid, the kid doesn't care about my problems. Oh, He's just hungry. And the families are so starving. Great. They're really hungry, guys. This isn't a pretend thing no. these kids are hungry and won't get it if they're not given it right and and we're not enabling either that was my fear is that when does this cross that line of now we're enabling people not to work and get out of their situation so we joined uh places out of la and atlanta called Sec step up on second harvest or step up on second i'll say that slower step, step up, up on, on second, second. It's tough yes one. And they're more transitionary. They're like, 
We'll give you low rent housing. You can stay here as long as you're employed, but we're going to keep working on your case until you get on your own. And I felt like this was the direction that we needed to keep going, keep doing what we're doing for the desert areas, but let's start moving into a more productive uh, focus where our impact can still be measured in, in food, right? You got to have that metric. Uh, and, but the impact is going towards a cause that has already been figured out. I didn't have to figure that up. Uh, they did it in LA, they branched out in Atlanta, and then they had their first opening here down in Sanford. So to answer your question about what's it like for me, that was a big relief on the inside in my heart because I didn't want to uh, enable uh, these families. Uh oh, that's a okay. robocall. Sorry. All right. we, don't, we didn't have a dog barking. Uh, you had one earlier. I, I had one I earlier. Have... That's right. So um, the fear going into 2021 that we talked about prior to the show is that the grants are, are coming up due. They're going to be done in June. Hello. So. Okay, so the grants, explain that. So the grants end, there's an ending point, guys, for a grant. You have to usually apply for it yearly or there's some sort of time frame. Sometimes it goes longer. So on the grant, yes, it sounds great to get it, but you a lot of times have to reapply for it every year. Every year, and there's um, um, all of our Q1 donors from years past have pushed all of their applications to Q4. So... That was a surprise. I was like, okay, so we're talking about nine months of not even applying and then waiting for the grant to get approved. Wow. So all of our old methods of sustaining our overhead, which as a caveat to become a, a food, just independent food, food distributor, we had to get a facility. We had to get trained. We had to pay all the licenses that you know any any company pays. Before that, we were working out of our homes and a storage unit, right? We would have food drives. We would have we'd pack on a second day, delivered it on Fridays to all the schools. The whole the whole thing changed with COVID. You've got immediate food. It's immediately packed. It's ready. It's in kind donation. We did over a half million dollars of in kind donations last year. Well. What do I do? I've got to raise a half million dollars just to repeat that, or it stops. And that's that's why I said I was a little afraid, you know, this morning is that uh, we're doing everything we can as a group, as as a board, and our wonderful volunteers to um, really ask a very tired group of people of donors, right? Kind of like, hey, you know, we. we uh, we gave it the office, right? right. We, we gave it to 2020. We're good for the decade. Right. Um, and it's like, is this going to go away? I I, I hope so it what's does. what's the plan? Because I know I've been there. I, I think we've talked about it. My master's degree is in, it's got to focus somewhere in it on nonprofit. So I've worked in the nonprofit sector for a long time. I think one of the biggest scary things always is, am I going to have the funding? And what happens when, government red tape holds it up or your donors yeah. get tired, which we all have been for the last year. How do you find new resources and re-energize the community? Because the impact you're making on the community is so, it's short term, but the long-term implications are overwhelming. These kids yeah. won't be hungry. They will still be able to learn. Um, there's so much that goes along with feeding children and how starving children just can't function and it has long-term impact on them as adults. So what can we do as a community to embrace you? Well, we started with an idea. Why don't we start having coordinated events where people have fun? Like uh, we got with, got with uh, Eric Duchesne at Lake Mary Top Golf, nice. and because Top Golf is very popular in Orlando, but since we're Seminole County based and we want to grow into Volusia, Brevard, Orlando's really taken care of when it comes to the nonprofit dollar. Like there, there was a dollar, there's out of the 550, 500 of them are pretty much centered around Orlando. Right. The scattered ones, the rest of us uh, that make up that 550 are Seminole, um, Lake County, Volusia County and Brevard County. And uh, if we don't take care of ourselves, and we don't make it fun now. I, this was my approach. I'm like, 
we have to throw a party and then make some money at the end of it. So Eric Duchesne and uh, at uh, Top Golf and uh, Courtney Fleming came together at a uh, county meeting and they stepped up and they said, we'll help you throw a fundraiser. Nice. And so we've got one coming up on March 16th. We'll, I'll talk more about in a, in a little bit. Um, May 16th? Or, May 16th. I said March. So all right. Listen, I had to look down to make sure we had passed March 16th. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. Yeah, it was a great event. I don't even remember it. I lost a week somewhere. I don't know what's going on. The booze, the booze must have been really good. <laughs> Ooh, I'll tell you. Well, and so the question to answer the question, you have to pivot. You have to keep on the on the nonprofit, okay, uh, masters, right? Is that if you aren't able to pick up your board when the wave ends and go back out into the ocean and find a new wave, then you're not gonna make it. It's not a cash cow. You can't sit back, you can't rely on don't lean, I call it leaning. Um, you have to constantly be creating, generating fun ways for people who want to get out of the house. That was number one. So where do they wanna go? What do they wanna do? That was number two. And how can we make donating a fun thing yes. rather than a, uh, you know, I already gave. You know, I already already donated. I'm already giving twenty five dollars a month. Oh, so Top Golf. Okay, it just dawned on me. Top Golf is the golf tournament yes. that you're talking about for me. I love this. Okay, I've yeah. done a bunch. You don't even have to. You don't even have to golf. You can just I, I, sit back and have free drinks. And uh, there's toss across. There's live music. We've rented out the entire bottom floor. No way. Tickets are only a hundred and twenty five dollars. Uh, that covers your food, your drink, appetizers. Um, sponsor levels are really low. To be an event sponsor at this event is only $10,000. Now, that feeds folks for a week, but the way we're pivoting is that if we can get these grants coming in, then we can pay the, the facility. See, our costs now, which we didn't have before, are a fraction of you know, where most of the money goes, right? So out of, out of uh, $2, $1.72 goes from the truck into the car, into the kid. Wow. So that leaves how much? 28, 28 cents. 28 cents for overhead. Wow. We, didn't, we didn't have that kind of overhead before. Right. So where it takes us, you know, we have staff. I'm, this is my job now but I've decided not to take any money until we can get above a certain level. Um, that takes a hit on us, you know. Oh my God, it takes a huge hit on you. Yeah, because it's like, where's the revenue gonna come from? Because I stopped working all my jobs uh, to do this. And then I was doing all that. And like you said, in Q4, it dawned on me, I need some help. <laughs> and then you get, then you get a lot of people that want to help you for $20,000 a year. And you're like, okay, now we need to really rethink our budget and right. fill out the long form 990s and join non the NPO, NPO connects. And you understand what this means. And I, I don't do. want to talk over people's heads, but what this means is that the more credible you seem, the more someone can do research on you on other sites that are vetted, that have vetted you and cross checked you, to say, yeah, they did do a half million dollars worth of food last year. Right. And you know, the year before that, they only did 20,000 years. That jump would probably say, you know, uh, cause a visit from the IRS. Going, <laughs> what are you doing? And it's like, we just used the money, the emergency funds. Here's the other thing about grants. The emergency grants were issued Im immediately. Right. When the president said, stay home, the emergency grants came in a couple of weeks for the food. Correct. I'm not talking about a uh, stimulus package or any stuff like that. For the That's food, the, the emergency food. Just the emergency, they call EM packets, EM food packets. And so when those numbers started growing for us, it was all about coordinating volunteers, uh, getting a facility, getting it licensed, getting it inspected, having the fire chief come by. All of it, that. It's, it's very all encompassing. And I think that you make you make it so many nonprofits make it seem like it's seamless. 
And what people need to understand is that there is so much volunteer time, even by Eric coming on as the figurehead, it's all volunteer. Um, the organizations volunteer. And so it is good to eventually get to a part where you can have a paid administration person or a pay or some paid help because that keeps the consistency going. Um, trust me, I, I, I get all those things that you're doing. You guys have done an amazing job there. Thanks, Ted. And you know, you understand that it's good to have staff. I didn't, in the beginning, I thought having staff was a bad thing. I thought if we could just have this all volunteer, this is 2016. If we could just all have no overhead and do it out of our homes. And, and I thought that was a good thing. And did you know Publix refused to give us money for three years in a row? And we're still waiting to apply uh, this year because we didn't have any staff in place. We didn't have any structure. We didn't have any budget. We didn't spend any time talking about our metrics. And most grants, most grants back in the old days, uh, you had you had to have some sort of paid out of it. Now there was a cap as to how much percentage of the overall money they were giving you. But yes, it adds this, um, not really credibility, but sustainability. Okay, they've got somebody, they, they've got enough money to, to support a staff, they must, be good with business. I, it's just a cra I used to review grants as well, so it's just a crazy thought process on it. Uh, but it's it's important. But you don't think that you think, oh, everybody will donate if it's a hundred percent. Nobody's making any money, and that's not really how grants work or were set up to work. All right, I hate to cut us short, but we're out of time. Okay. What do you have to share? How can they get? I've got the website going across the bottom. Uh, okay. We know May sixteenth is the date, so we want people to reach out. Uh, book, get involved, sponsor. How can they give back to you? Okay, so on our website, on the home page, there's the donate. You can donate however much you want. Then there, right below it, is our event. And there's two ways you can participate. You can be a sponsor, and there's six different sponsors that you could choose from. You can also buy tickets. We have a hundred people. We're planning on you know, coming to this event. If a hundred people paid for this event, we've covered the cost for the event. And then whoever pays after that is goes to the kids. So our, our biggest thing right now is to keep doing what we're doing. Keep showing up for these kids every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, keep being consistent. And I'll end with this because our target audience is food insecure people children who don't know where their next meal is coming from. We've been a reliable source for more than 54 weeks in a row. And for us to keep that going, all we need is for someone to say, you know what, for the price of a meal for my family, I'm gonna sponsor our whole family for a month. And that's what we really need, is that monthly reoccurring income so that we can pay our expenses and go get the grants and all of that. So. That's we why want to embrace you. All right, the website's going across the bottom. Um, guys, you get involved. This is such an amazing organization. Think of all the people in reality that you saved during those times where they had no, didn't know where else to go. Um, and it makes an impact on all of us when our kids are hungry. I'm just telling you, it is, it's epidemic. And places like Eric, this organization is amazing. And just because I had somebody ask me, they looked you up, just because Seminole County in your mind is the richest county on the planet. That is not necessarily the case when it comes to starving children, hungry children. So please don't let that stop you from donating and getting involved. I'll leave you with one last uh, heart pulling moment. As kids went back to school, they found in Seminole County that the kids sitting next to them had been evicted from their homes. Ugh. They were made fun of at lunchtime because they wanted two pizzas instead of one pizza. The, the, the new pandemic is the hunger pandemic yeah. and, it, and it's coming and we're the solution. So thank you, Ted, for having us again on your show. I appreciate you. I think the world of you, you're amazing. What all of you do, you, your wife, the entire team. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it is just check him out. Come talk to me. I will tell you. Everything's there. Get involved, guys. It's so critical. And just because you're getting back into the normal doesn't mean nonprofits are, do not still have record numbers that they are trying to get their services to, including feeding our kids. Thank you, Eric, so much for all you do, my friend.
Thank you as well, Ted. Thanks All for right, having me. All right, guys. We'll see you. We'll see you back.